She's on your shelf. Mm. Well, we're definitely starting this one off with a bang. While we don't know much about what's going on so far, we do know that this one is classified as a horror, so this is just par for the course. This is 2020's The Sinners. Spoiler alert for those of you that wish to watch this film on your own time, links to the film are in the description. This definitely feels like a prologue to The Purge, but it turns out that that gaggle of friends kills the girl. As the opening credits roll, Aubrey reads the love chapter from the Bible, and we find Aubrey dead with a rose in her mouth. Finally, Aubrey lets us know that this story is about how her body ended up at the bottom of the lake. When we go back in time, we see Hannah and Grace getting their makeup on, and we find out that there's a big religious tone in this household. At the school, we meet Katie who pulls up in a brand new car, and a bunch of other girls pour out of her car. As Aubrey sees her friends arrive, she goes to meet up with them, but the girl she's sitting with warns her that they're no good. Soon, Aubrey explains that their little group is called The Sins. Growing up in a religious town has its pros and cons, and the Sins loved the attention they got for who they were. Now Aubrey gives us a quick rundown of who's all in the group. Katie is greed, Stacy's envy, Robin's sloth, Molly's gluttony, Tori's wrath, Aubrey's pride, and Grace is lust. And I can tell you I'm a sucker for any films or shows that show off the seven deadly sins, so this is already a win for me. After a little outburst in class, we can see why Tori was given the sin of wrath as she's sent to the principal's office. Aubrey goes on to explain that she really didn't mind being a part of the circle, and she even loved being friends with Grace. Yet recently she's been feeling envious towards Grace, and that wasn't even her sin. Meanwhile, Sheriff Fred goes to check on his wife, Maggie. Maggie, what are you doing to me? Maggie? Maggie, Maggie! This is a Christian school. Actually, it shouldn't even matter that it's Christian. This is a school, Ms. Lady. Maggie tells Fred that he has nine minutes before the next bell, and he jumps on the chance. Sure enough, he's walking the halls well before the bell goes off, and we cut over to Grace and Tori in the parking lot. Here we meet Kit, and he wants to talk to Grace privately. He drives them to a lakeside road, and he apologizes for his behavior the night before. They begin to kiss, but when Grace pulls away, he begins to lose his patience with her. Grace leaves him there and walks through the woods until she runs into Summer. Do we just run into woodland people in this town? This random woman seems to know that Grace likes Tori, and she knows that she hasn't told anyone yet. Not to mention, is Kit really getting mad because Grace wanted to take things slow? You're dating a Christian girl in a very Christian town. What was he really expecting? Soon, Grace comes up to a shop based out of a van, and she finds Andy inside. She talks to him about running into Summer a second before, and he tells her that he cut his hand while making something for Summer. After he cleans up the blood, Grace goes out to run the storefront, and the principal shows up to buy a succulent for his house. That night, Grace sits down with her family for dinner, and her father, the pastor, tells her that someone came to confess things about her. He tells her that he knows about the sins, and he doesn't want her being around anyone that isn't part of the church community anymore. I'll just be a good little lamb and follow blindly in the path of the Lord. Bah! Why is it always the pastor's kids that are the rebellious ones? Honestly, she's not even being that bad, but she's literally making a mockery of their religion at the dinner table. I laughed my butt off, but that's beside the point. That night in the woods, women gathered to call on Lucifer, and after a ritual is performed, we see that Grace is one of the members involved. It turns out that it's all in her head, but Grace feels as though she's part of a real invocation. How is this little coven reaching Grace through her dreams? She even wakes up at 3.33. Granted, that's a little after the witching hour, but the premise is still there. The next morning, Grace dresses in a small black dress and heels and Tori can't believe what she sees. As Grace goes through class, she catches her principal peeking at her assets. But the focus here is that Aubrey leaves the classroom to go to the bathroom. The remaining sins steal Aubrey's journal, and it doesn't look like what they found is good news. In a lot behind the school, six of the sins gathered to talk about Aubrey's journal. In it, they found out that Aubrey is the one that talked to the pastor. The group finds out that Aubrey actually knows way more about all their indiscretions than she lets on and they decide that they need to scare her into keeping her mouth shut from now on. That night, Grace gathers the girls at her house for a little Bible study, and when Aubrey arrives, Grace begins to chant the same chant she heard in her dream. Suddenly, Aubrey begins to realize that this isn't the Bible study she had thought it was going to be. What did it for? The Latin that they're chanting or the cheesy devil horns Grace put on her head? Grace should have gone to Spirit Halloween and picked up some of those realistic ones. She probably would have sent Aubrey into a religious fit by seeing them. Grace decides that it's time to take their sins to the next level, and some of the girls rip up Aubrey's Bible. 
When Grace and Tori kiss, it seems to make some other members realize their real sexuality. When Grace makes Aubrey put a hunting rifle in Grace's mouth, it seems to be the last straw for Aubrey. Aubrey admits that she should have been scared into not saying anything, but she couldn't help but to tell the pastor what had happened. While I'm not condoning murder, she was fairly warned. Unless you're 100% sure it was a bluff, you do not just tattle to the daddy priest. You go to the police or keep your mouth shut. She could have just stopped being friends with them and gone off on her own, and everything probably would have been peachy keen. Also, where did Christian girls find chloroform in their sleepy little town? They kidnap Aubrey and take her to a lake cabin where Tori starts to hurt Aubrey. After they decide to talk to her instead, Aubrey disappears into the forest. As the girls search for her, after they can't find her, the girls head out, and Aubrey continues to wander the forest. That night, Grace stays up and reads Aubrey's journal, and she begins to weep as she regrets her actions. The next morning, everyone goes about their normal school day, but Aubrey's missing from class. When the principal comes to class to retrieve the sins, they hurriedly decide to deny everything. They're still thinking that Aubrey made it home and is waiting to tell on them, but when Grace is brought into the office, she's met by the sheriff. He tells her that Aubrey's missing, but Grace doesn't give them anything to go off of. Eventually, they go through all of the girls, but questioning them seems to get them nowhere in their investigation. When they get back to class, they notice that someone has scribbled the seven sins on Grace's desk and crossed out pride. So there's another psycho in the school now? Or maybe it's Aubrey and she's embraced her dark side. Yeah, I highly doubt that, but how could anyone have scribbled that in the middle of class and no one knows who did it? It's either supernatural or a plot hole. That afternoon, when Katie goes home, she's kidnapped by a masked figure. While everyone is at a vigil for Aubrey, Katie's shown being tied up in a barn, and the figure takes a blowtorch. Soon after, Katie's body was found with a rose in her mouth, and greed is crossed off of Grace's desk. During the funeral, we see that Katie has a huge turnout. When Aubrey's father gets up to talk, he rallies the support of just about everyone there. Come on, show yourself! Yeah. I feel like they just made a whole little section for cowboys there and told them to wait until that line to jump up and almost start a search party. He puts his hat on and everything for it. As we see members of the community start to crack, Grace and the others keep their composure as best they can. Out in the parking lot, Grace listens to Andy give him condolences until Sheriff Fred shows up and arrests him for the murder of Katie. Apparently Andy's gardening gloves were found by Katie's body. That night at dinner, Grace's family is quieter than usual, and her father doesn't help make things any better. He talks about how he had warned Grace away from Andy, and he goes on to say that that's two dead friends that could have easily been her. Wait, how does he know that both of the girls are dead? Last I remember, Aubrey's still only missing in the town's eyes. Sounds sus to me. Grace heads upstairs and calls for a friend to come pick her up, and she grabs Aubrey's journal while she waits. Eventually, Tori comes to pick her up, and Grace says that they need to burn the journal before someone finds it. Grace blames herself for everything that's happened, and she's worried that it isn't going to stop anytime soon. After they get to the cabin, we cut to the man in a mask that's kidnapped another girl, and he's dosing her with something. As he goes to cut her, the screen cuts back to Grace and Tori. They burn the journal in the fireplace, and Tori consoles her as best she can. As Grace tells her that she loves her, the two of them get a little more personal with each other. I feel like we haven't addressed the other girls in a while, and I don't like how hyper-focused we are on these two. It's the seven deadly sins, not the two buddy sins. Grace soon remembers that they need to destroy the masks too, and Tori goes out to her car to get them. When she's out there, she hears rustling and a dog growling. She immediately runs back inside and tells Grace that she thinks someone's outside. Meanwhile, the masked man has killed another one, and we see him taking a picture of a pentagram he carved on her stomach. When Grace and Tori go out to investigate, they find Molly's dead body in the field. What happens when the sheriff shows up at Grace's house is almost a complete turnaround for her family. The sheriff shows up to ask Grace and Tori more questions, but Grace's mother and father kind of go at the sheriff and tell him he needs to do his job better and pray more. Even when the sheriff mockingly asks if praying more would help him solve crimes, the pastor says that at least the wrong man wouldn't be behind bars. Oh snap! I mean, I still don't like him or trust him, but suspicious pastor gets points for that. In a crazed emotional state, Grace and Tori stomp out of the house as they yell that it's all their fault. When they get into the car, they start to blame each other for where they are, and they scream as they try to let out how they feel. Meanwhile, the masked man has another one, and he's taking a picture of her to commemorate the moment. Grace and Tori make their way to Andy's van, but when he answers the door, he doesn't want to be any more involved since he's already been framed for murders before. 
He does tell them that whoever is doing this has planned everything out. They had his gloves, stole flowers from the shop, and the toxicology reports show bleach was used in the preservatives for the flowers. After letting that bit slip, Andy and Summer go back inside and close the door on Grace's face. In town, Sheriff Fred's trying to piece the puzzle together when he finds out that the pastor's called some high-up friends. He finds two of his former partners from the city are in his office, and they say that they're here to clean up his mess and handle the case that he can't seem to solve. Honestly, the way they talk to him is so disrespectful. Even if he was a bad cop before, he's the sheriff of a whole town. He still deserves some respect. But these guys are just belittling him as much as they can at the moment. They even put down the little deputy. Poor guy didn't even do anything to them. Grace doesn't seem to be handling the stress of the situation too well, and Tori tries to coach her through controlling her anxiety. Once she's composed herself, Grace decides that they need to return to the cabin for some reason. At the same time, the masked man has yet another girl. This time, she isn't dead when he takes a picture of her, and the man ends up shooting her. Grace and Tori pull up to the cabin, and when Grace finds the front door open, she gets a little cautious as she looks around inside. Obviously, that one girl is Aubrey. Can't miss the hair. The whole time I've been feeling sorry for her, but now I'm thinking she teamed up with the creepy pastor to put the fear of God into the town. Like a Christian Batman and Robin. Weirder things have happened. The police officers show up at the coroner's house, and they try to find the files on Aubrey's case. But the deputy finds the Polaroids that the masked man has been taking of the girls. Just as they piece things together, we go over to the cabin where we find Aubrey and Feldman have tied up Grace. As Aubrey makes herself known, Grace can't believe her eyes. Sheriff makes his old colleagues leave town, and he compliments the deputy for putting two and two together for them. What did you know about the eternal sin? It's the unforgivable sin. He who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit shall never be forgiven. I actually didn't even know there was an unforgivable sin. Isn't that kind of the whole premise of Christianity? The ability to have all your sins forgiven? I might be a little rusty on this one, but maybe one of you knows something I don't? Aubrey goes on to talk about the next few people she plans to save the same way. Grace tries to ask for forgiveness, but Aubrey still thinks she has to cleanse the earth of her wickedness. The more Aubrey delves into how she used Feldman to make her plan perfect, the more maniacal she seems. I'm the wolf! And you know what happens to the wolf and the- This seems like a pointless double cross. Feldman's still going to jail for murder. Maybe he was just tired of hearing Aubrey babble on? Either way, Aubrey's face keeping the exact same expression as she gets shot makes that a nice little memorable moment. As the sheriff heads to the cabin, Feldman makes Grace and Tori drop Aubrey's body in the lake. When they go back inside, Feldman tries to make them agree to take the blame for everything. But Sheriff Fred shows up. Feldman shoots Fred. Tori disarms Feldman and she shoots him in the head. This was a quick resolution where they don't even give you time to let it sink in before it moves on to the next thing. I still like it, but I still have more questions, like who's Feldman afraid of if he was to go to prison? When the deputy comes in, he calls for an ambulance to pick up the sheriff, and he brings the girls in for questioning. As the last of the love chapter is narrated, the deputy drives off with the girls, and the credits roll. In light of some of the movies I've watched recently, it's nice to have a movie that actually had me on my toes a couple of times. The use of the seven deadly sins is always a win in my book, and they use that with the mixture of a religious town perfectly. Definitely give it a shot. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more like this one. Comment what you think I should watch next, and I'll see you in the next video.